So we're coming up to the end of this 30 Days of Taker video series. You got one more Q&A coming up after this, which talks about after the streak ended, um, dealing with that time frame the last few years of his career. So feels like it's a good time now to plug the 30 Days of Taker video series. You should check it out. The playlist link is in the description box below. Uh, you can go ahead and subscribe if you haven't done so already. Um, but today I wanted to talk about you know, bringing this all kind of full circle and bringing it at least somewhat to closure. And that is talking about what is The Undertaker's legacy? What is it? What's it going to be? What will it be a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, 50 years from now? And I think, you know, you talk about it, there's a lot to unwrap there. You know, number one, you're talking about a guy that has been so fundamentally important to this company and Vince McMahon for so many years. One of the true pillars and bedrocks of this company. And not just that for some period of time or a bit of a period of time. But you're literally talking about a guy that was that for decades. Like he spanned generations. Both generations of the company and its evolution and changes over the years. But also just generations, period, when you talk about being around for 30 dang years. Even if you want to talk about the past few years, he wasn't around that much. Still, like 30 years is 30 years to be doing something with any type of relevancy whatsoever. And Taker certainly has always been relevant. I mean, you think about this is a guy that debuted back when George H.W. Bush was president. You know, and he spanned the rest of that administration to the eight years of Clinton, the eight years of W. Bush, the eight years of Obama. Like, you, you think about it, like, that gives you some historical context just in terms of the sheer length of this guy. But, you know, when you think about it, it's about more than just length. It's about the ability to be relevant and to be a key cog, a key contributor for all of those years. And when I think about Taker, I think about a guy who had a great talent for being able to feel where he needed to go with his character, being able to feel what the audience wanted from him, and always being able to make those small tweaks and adjustments and changes to help keep things fresh. And even when the things such as the entrance aren't fresh, it's so different and so cool, and it represents so much because of the respect that fans have for that one man that people don't mind. They just don't. But you're talking about a guy that came in initially. He didn't say anything. He just came in and squashed people. And then you added the Paul Bear element to him. And all of a sudden, now he's got a voice. And Taker started finding his voice as a character and his voice as a talker. Um, and you just talk about the evolution over the years. And you think about it in the early years of his career. The fact that this was a guy that didn't always get put in the best situations. Like having a feud with guys like Giant Gonzalez and Kamala, and I, I could go on and on and on. Like, not everything was gold, not everything was rosy in terms of Taker's opponents, Taker's stories, etc. And I think one of the key things you can always point to with Taker, and I have an utmost respect for him for that, among other things, is that you never felt like he was taking a night off. You never felt like he didn't care. You never felt like he was going out there and going to rip the fans off. He was going to give his most, his absolute best, be totally lost in his character in the moment and focused entirely on that the entire time. And he oftentimes tried to make gold out of doo-doo. And it didn't always work. But I think in some ways, that's why so many people respect Taker. Is they remember some of those early years and the fact that the story wasn't always that great that he was involved in. The opponents weren't always that great that he was involved in. You can look at some of his early WrestleMania matches. Like, Snooker was washed up by the time he faced him at WrestleMania 7. You know, Jake was great for WrestleMania 8, but Jake was also on his way out. You got WrestleMania 9, you're talking about giant freaking Gonzalez. You know, when Taker wrestles again at Mania 11, it's an older King Kong Bundy. Like, you know what I mean? Like, this guy was stuck in some really bad spots, and... You know, this is also a guy that has transcended from the Hogan era to that kind of new generation era. Was there as one of the pillars of the Attitude Era, the Monday Night Wars. 
a ruthless aggression era. You know, and you can go on the PG era, like you can go on and on and on. And he's been there for all of it and be a, been a critical part of it. Um, you know, here is a guy that when you think about legacies, like when we think about WrestleMania, he will always be one of the first, if not the first pe person that we think of. He will always be. He wrestled more at WrestleMania than anybody else, and that record may or may not be touched unless God puts himself in five or six more WrestleMania matches over the years. So he's had the most WrestleMania matches. He had by far the most wins from a kayfabe standpoint. He's 25-2. and two. You know, You're talking about the streak became as closely associated with WrestleMania as any other talent, any other match, or anything else. Like you think about for years, the first thing that people would often think about when it came to WrestleMania was not who's the Royal Rumble going to challenge, winner going to challenge for a title, but who's going to face off against Taker to try and end the streak. Like the streak was a monster. The streak became him. The streak became the event. Like, you would have title changes happen every year at Mania, but the one thing that would never happen is take her losing at WrestleMania. But you just think about, like, that's just one small piece of it to me. You're also thinking about the guy that helped elevate so many guys that he worked with over the years and wasn't afraid to put other guys over because he understood that it wasn't just about him, that it was about helping other guys so that way they could make more money, so that way he could make more money, so that way everybody on the card could make more money. Like, take her could have been more selfish, and he could have, over the years, played more political games than the sporadic ones he may have played, and insisted on having more world championship runs. And certainly, based off the length of time, based off of some of the drawing power of the character, you could have made that so. Like, it's kind of tragic, a guy that's been with the company 30 years, you know, you're not talking about him being at the top in terms of most world championships of all time. He just isn't. In fact, if I remember correctly, I don't even think he's ever even been intercontinental champion. But he, if anything else, is a perfect example of sometimes belts make stars, but sometimes stars don't need belts. And Tanker to me was always that guy that you were so engrossed in the story and you were so engrossed in him and what he was doing and who his opponent was and what his opponent was doing that the belts would always become secondary by nature anyways. They just really didn't matter. And not everybody can be comfortable with that. Not everybody can understand that. And while, yes, he certainly got some world championship reigns over the years, I mean, none of them are truly all that notable or all that memorable, are they? Not really. But you remember a lot of feuds and a lot of programs, a lot of rivalries, a lot of stories that Taker was involved in. And again, I think that speaks to the testament of the power of the character and the performer. And when you think about the fact that in an era where, and this has been true probably for the past couple of decades, where attention spans are shorter than ever, where fans aren't patient, the industry isn't patient, you know, just pop culture isn't very patient. We want instant gratification, we want the payoff, and we want the payoff now. The fact that this guy could continue to appear month after month, year after year, and have that level of ability to connect with the fans to be able to um, keep them captivated, to keep them interested, is truly a special talent. It might be his greatest talent of all, because you just don't see that. Like, I could even go back to a much simpler time when you think about Hogan, you know, and the fact that he was the unquestioned man for years in that company in the 80s. And then as the 90s started to come along, like, Hogan still had cool factor, and he was the dude, but it wasn't quite the same, and you were starting to have some fans lose interest, and some fans start to boo him a little bit. Now, I don't recall that ever really happening with Taker to the sense where the fans were turning on him as a character. Should have turned on him in that freaking human run from 2000 to 2003, but y'all didn't. You might have booed him sometimes because you were designed to boo him. You were supposed to boo him, and that's fine, but I'm just saying. But even the, even that stretch of three and a half years that I absolutely detest in his career where he was a mortal taker. He was the American badass and big evil taker. At least I'll say this about him. Like, he changed his character. He evolved. He did something different. As much as I don't like it, it probably added years to his career and relevancy, and it certainly added a lot of nostalgia appeal back to when he came back as the dead man at WrestleMania 20 and really never fully uh, went away from that. 
Whereas some guys like a John Cena never learned that lesson. You know, they just sat there and rode the coattails of their one gimmick for as long as they possibly can. They never evolved and they never changed. And that's why even when those types of guys come back, there's not much of a nostalgia pop there because you're just coming back and doing the same crap you always did. It's what would have happened with Hogan if he would have continued to stay in the WWF past 93. Vince would have never turned him heel. He would have never done that. Hogan had to go somewhere else to freshen up. And even that took time. They were trying to do the red and yellow Hulkamania crap down south. That crap wasn't going to work. But Taker again, like I said, you're talking about a guy that was able to evolve and adapt and change his character over the years. And you think about Taker to me as much as anything else. Like if I was pointing out why have I watched professional wrestling all these years and why do I think professional wrestling can be one of the coolest forms of entertainment that exists. There are certain people I'm going to point to depending on age and demographics. Like, I'll always point to The Rock and Austin. I'll point out guys like Hogan, Andre, Macho Man. I'll point out guys like JYD and Jake the Snake, obviously, as well. But then I'll also point out somebody like The Undertaker. And just look at the crap that this character did over the years. All the supernatural stuff, the special effects, what have you. And people might say, well, that's corny and that's hokey. Well, that's what professional wrestling is, is its core. It's corny and hokey. It's a lot of half-naked men wrestling at each other, pretending to hurt each other, to get to a predetermined finish. That is corny and hokey as hell. But when you think about Taker, you think about you know theatrics, you think about you know, the movie-like type of presentation, like it's so perfectly professional wrestling. And, you know, you show somebody who maybe doesn't watch wrestling or doesn't have interest in wrestling this guy, and he's going to stand out and he's going to impress people. I guarantee it. Even old Taker would do that, let alone young Taker that fly around the ring and do all these amazing athletic feats. My goodness, are you kidding me? You know, to me, the ultimate legacy of The Undertaker is one of the truly all-time great characters, not just in WWF slash E history, but in wrestling history, period. When I think about The Undertaker, I think about a guy that was able to last and thrive over three decades in different forms, in different ways, in different shapes, in different amounts, but he was able to thrive. And just not a lot of people in wrestling history, period, can say that. There are very, very few that can legitimately say that. I can say the appeal in year 30 is damn near every bit the same appeal as year one, if not more so. And Taker could certainly do that. I also think about him in terms of as a pure WWE performer, as an in-ring talent. Like when I think about those wrestlers that I truly respect the most, when you when I'm thinking about like a Mount Rushmore of respect, it's the guys like him and Mick Foley that are on that. Because those are the guys that you know, traditionally, you know, take her at his moments where he had a little political power play, sure. But overwhelmingly, this was a guy that was always in it for the greater good. He wasn't just in it for himself. This was a guy that always was looking for ways to make the company better. And sometimes would sacrifice himself for the greater good. And you have to have a ton of respect for guys like that. And I know I certainly do. Like my ultimate legacy for The Undertaker is all of that and just the fact that you know, he will always be one of my favorite wrestlers of all time. And I have so many great memories associated with Taker over the years, and they will never go away until I'm old and withering and gray and sitting on my porch. I'm probably still going to be talking about, I remember The Undertaker threw Mick Foley off the cage at Hell in a Cell 98! Or excuse me, King of the Ring 98! See, I'm already getting old! Like I'm mixing up the match stipulation with the damn show! It shows how long I've been around, so how long Taker's been around! That crap happened back when I was in high school. But the legacy is a great one. One of the true greats. One of the truly important figures in WWF slash E history. And it's just sad to still think about the fact that, you know, for all intents and purposes, it's done. Even if he comes back, it works another match or two. I mean, reality for me is it's done because I don't watch the Saudi shows anyway. So if he wrestles there, you know, nothing. Um, but I'm curious to hear from you guys. As you think about everything, what will ultimately be Undertaker's legacy to you? Like, What do you think of when you think of The Undertaker? What do you think he will be most remembered for? Is it the streak? Is it the 30 years? Is it the character? Like, what is it? Tell me in the comments section below. Make sure you tune in tomorrow 
Got one more installment, as I mentioned, of this 30 Days of Taker video series. I will see you then.